Hi, we need to talk. I have something I need to tell you, and I'm not sure what you'll think of it, but maybe we can work this out. <sighs> There's no easy way of saying it. I'm seeing another turbine. You're giving me the silent treatment. Fair enough. Let me tell you how it happened. It all started a while ago, when I was shaving my... My face. Yes, that's what I was doing. When suddenly I received a calling. In Texas, Sama, build the turbine. I know, I know, build the turbine. In Texas, build this, in Texas, build that. Always me. Jesus. Sorry. My mission was set, to create a new and original design for a 3D printable Tesla turbine, an invention capable of converting pressurized fluids into electricity. Version 2.0 To succeed in this mission I first needed to understand how the Tesla turbine works, and for that I studied the most trustworthy sources on the matter. And this is what I got. At the most basic level, a Tesla turbine is constituted by two components, the casing and the rotor. The casing normally has a circular shape and a tangential inlet to guarantee that when the pressurized fluid comes in, it naturally creates a vortex that spirals into the center of the closed enclosure. In the center, the fluid is conventionally expelled by openings placed on the lateral part of the casing. The rotor is a simple axis with several thin discs that is placed inside the casing, right at the center of the vortex. The air that travels in the vortex path is forced to go through the discs and because the air is a fluid, it has a certain stickiness to it, what makes it stick to the walls of the disc and drags them along its circular vortex path, thus making the axis rotate. A few videos ago I designed and printed a very simple version of this turbine, which was able to reach 25,000 rotations per minute. Was a pretty good result, but I also wanted to test other parameters, like electric power and efficiency. So I decided to design a new one. Because in the first design I used a threaded rod as an axis and metal nuts to secure the discs, which are both not 3D printed, I decided to 3D print all the components this time. Except for the ball bearings, because ball bearings are freaking hard to print. So yeah, I used regular ball bearings again. For this design I had some stuff I wanted to try. I wanted to exhaust the air through the center of the axis. The more the exhaust is near the center, the more surface area of the disc is touched by the air, which means more torque. I wanted to print thinner discs because thinner discs means less drag and more discs compact in the same space. I wanted to incorporate an electric generator supporting to the design, so I could attach a small DC motor to the axis and generate electricity. I also wanted to use a flow regulator so I could gradually increase the pressure to get high speed with as little back pressure as possible. The complete model for the new turbine was formed by four main parts. The casing, the axis, the lids and the discs. The casing is a simple linear extrusion from a 2D profile that was prepared with five holes in a star formation to fix the lids via screw connection. To make the path of the air as smooth and continuous as possible, I designed the card cut into the inner surface of the casing, that gradually disappear into its curvature. The lids match the profile of the casing, but at the center were prepared with two ball bearings with a 10mm inner diameter. The axis was designed to be simple to 3D print, with no overhangs and no complex cross sections. A hollow interior and openings in the central hub allow the air to flow in natural streamlines with almost no resistance. For the rotor, I wanted to use only 3D printed discs with a quarter of a millimeter in thickness and incorporated quarter of a millimeter spacers. But because that would give me an insane amount of discs to print, and some of you guys suggested that I use stuff like CDs and hard drive discs in the rotor, I decided to create a mixed rotor. The thing is, a lot of other YouTubers already use CDs and hard drive discs in their design, so I wanted to do something different. To follow the theme of using digital storage units as power hubs in a Tesla turbine, I decided to use 3.5 inches floppy disks. I had some laying around from a video I made on the art of cracking software, and they fit the criteria. They are thin and smooth disks with a hole in the center. The initial plan was to create a rotor comprised of 3D printed disks with an integrated spacer, 
floppy disks and floppy disk spacers. The first step was to disassemble the floppy disk so I could get the disk inside the casing. And the procedure is actually very simple. You just need to take the floppy disks and smash that like button. Come on, do it. Please. I need it. Now, in a more serious note, it's time to talk about this video's sponsor, Floppy Disks. Are you tired of convenient and small storage units that offer you way too many gigabytes of storage room? Are you an hipster that loves inappropriate and obsolete technology? Then this is the product for you. Floppy Disks. Buy now for only $9.99 and get another floppy disk completely free. After getting the 10 disks from the diskettes, I printed 10 disks and 10 floppy spacers. Taking my sub's advice, I decided to print the disks using only outline perimeters. Because the disks were only a quarter of a millimeter thick and formed by only two layers, I took some time to level my bed. After printing everything, I painted the spacers with black and red markers, so I could later align them with each other, because beyond being spacers, I also designed them to be paths that would guide the air into the openings of the central hub. Smart, right? I know. Don't forget to subscribe! In the next step, I assembled all of the discs. First, a 3D printed disc, then a floppy disc spacer, and then a floppy disc, creating an array in this order until I filled the entire hub. To keep everything in place, I printed a small red disc that I glued to the structure using acrylic resin. This is the final result. With the rotor ready, I could now print everything else. To print the casing, I chose my big girl Claudette with her big nozzle of 0.8mm in diameter. Look at those lines! Thick! With this bad girl, I can print in half a millimeter layers. Super thick! In the end, the surface quality wasn't the best, but it was good enough for the job, and the printing time was tiny, just like your mama's. Hey, what are you doing? Take your finger out of there. This is a family channel, dude. Anyway, next came the lids. First the simple one, and then the one with the motor support. Once I had all the main parts, I inserted the bearings in the lids and threaded the holes in the casing. To connect the motor to the axis of the turbine, I printed a customized coupler that compensates axis misalignment. I also glued a 6mm brass connector to the inlet so I could connect a flow regulator. This is the final setup. I was really anxious to test this version, so I rushed to the compressor to see what speeds this baby could pull off. After setting everything up, I was ready to use my new digital tachometer to make history. I slowly increased the airflow as I looked to the monitor of the tachometer, and as you can see, I failed. The turbine was barely getting to 5000 rotations per minute. I tried several times, and nothing. I had disgraced my family name. What would my subs think of me? The shame was too big. I had no other choice. I had to terminate my YouTube account. Maybe try another medium, like Tumblr or Instagram, or... Wait a second, something is wrong here. I'm pretty sure I had good ideas in that design. Well, except for the floppy disk one. That wasn't a great idea. And the openings in the lids should be closer to the center. Also, I shouldn't have printed a quarter of a millimeter in thickness disks. They are not that rigid, and the finish of the surface is not that great. Well, back to the drawing board! Ok, I needed to change some stuff, but not all of it. I kept the casing, but completely trashed the axis and the discs. The leads were not bad, but I needed to put the opening to the center, so I printed new ones on the Creality to get better quality finish. For better exhausting the air, I redesigned the discs to still guide the air to the openings on the hollow axis, but also have the conventional holes that allow the air to escape through the lids. This time I printed 10 discs with 0.75mm in thickness and spacing, so I could get a good stiffness and surface finish. Yeah, I said stiffness. Don't be immature. Because I'm an efficient guy, I took advantage of the openings on the discs and printed a new axis with built-in extruded guides to align the discs and also keep them from sliding. Looking at this footage, I was also reminded that I needed to cut my nails. 
so I also did that. To complete the rotor, I inserted all the discs and secured them in place without glue. Because a good recipe shouldn't be changed, I also printed a small flywheel where I placed a reflective marker for the digital tachometer. Once again, the turbine was ready to rumble. But before the final test, there was something I wanted to do. To know if the rotor was sinking with the speed of the air coming out of the compressor's nozzle, I first needed to find how fast the air was being expelled into the turbine. So this was what I did. I have a 100 liters tank attached to the compressor, which is filled with air at 10 bars of maximum pressure. As the air escapes, the pressure lowers and at 6.5 bars, a mechanical switch is triggered and the compressor starts filling up the tank to full capacity again. To calculate the average speed of the air at the nozzle, I needed to know how much air escapes between the 10 to 6.5 bars interval and how long it would take to happen with the nozzle completely opened. With these two values, I could calculate the flow rate at the nozzle, divide that by the nozzle's cross-section area and we get the linear speed of the air. First, I recorded a video of the barometer, barometer? barometer. present in the compressor as I discharged the tank with the nozzle completely open. I used the video to time how long it took the tank to get from 10 to 6.5 bars and that was precisely 64 seconds. To get the amount of air that escaped in this time period, I calculated the density of air at 10 and 6.5 bars. Knowing the volume of the tank, I calculated the difference in mass from one pressure to the other and converted that value into a volume of air at atmospheric pressure. Dividing that by the elapsed time, I got the volume flow rate. Dividing that by the cross-section area of the nozzle, I arrived at an average linear speed of 187 meters per second which is really impressive, and the speed of the world's fastest train. A record achieved by the Japanese maglev train in 2015. As impressive as this speed is for a train, it's not that impressive for airflow, since there are many compressor nozzles that can make the air go sonic or higher. We're talking about more than Mach 1, speeds higher than 343 meters per second. With 187 meters per second, we are at 50% of what we could get with a better nozzle, which tells me that the flow is being choked. But because I don't have any other nozzles for now, let that be a note for the future. Next, I used the circumference of the discs present in the turbine to estimate the theoretical rotation speed if the turbine was able to sink to the speed of the air. The result was 43,000 rotations per minute. My theoretical goal was set. It was time to test the turbine. After regulating the flow to get the best speed possible, I got a stable speed of 20,000 rotations per minute, with a maximum speed of 24,000 RPMs. I know this doesn't sound very impressive, since the version 1 was able to reach 25,000 RPMs without any of these fancy design implementations. But you need to understand that the version 1 had a metallic machined axis with much better tolerances and almost no vibration. Also, version 2 has a bigger work volume, which means it was designed for lower flow rates and higher torque. And let me tell you, this one has definitely more torque than the other one. I know that because every time I ran a test, I needed to stop the turbine to start again, and most of the times I almost burned my fingers doing it. Unfortunately, I don't have a device to measure torque, but who knows, maybe I'll build one in the future. What I do have is a multimeter to measure the current and the voltage coming out of the motor. I measured 12 volts with no load at maximum speed and 0.37 amperes of current with the internal load of the multimeter and a top speed of around 3000 RPMs. Once more I had a lot of fun making this project and I learned stuff that will be useful for future designs. For example, now I know that I need to improve my nozzle so I can get the fastest air speed I can get from my compressor. Also, I need to use non-printed axes and discs. And I need a better setup to measure the electrical power and mechanical power of the turbine. What do you think? Do you agree with me? Tell me your thoughts in the comment section below. Officially, this is the last video on the Tesla turbine series. But of course I will try again later, in the near future. For now, I have some project ideas I want to implement in the next videos, and I will share them with you on the community tab of my channel. For now, is everything.
I hope you enjoyed the video. Until the next time, bye-bye.